True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. After a night of clubbing with a friend in New York City, the beautiful and kind 20-year-old Kim Antonakis disappeared. Kim was on her way home in the early morning hours when she was abducted. Her father, wealthy businessman Tommy Antonakis, immediately began a widespread and organized search for his daughter. What he didn't know was that Kim's abductors were supposed friends of Kim. Right under Tommy's nose, these cold-blooded men pretended to care about her and even to participate in his search for his daughter. Join us at the quiet end for Seized and Scorched. Everything about Kim's abduction showed unbridled cruelty and extraordinary incompetence. When plans to hold Kim hostage for money didn't go according to plan, Kim's abductors panicked and took Kim's life. But not only was her young life stolen from her and those who loved her, Kim died an agonizing, slow death, leaving her unrecognizable. Before the investigation was completed, another murder would occur, revealing that the callousness of at least one of her killers ran deeper than was even imagined. So today's beer, it's an American Imperial Stout called Even More Jesus from Evil Twin Brewing in Brooklyn. This is one of those big mothers, 12% alcohol by volume. So it's pitch black color, kind of an oily appearance, Small tan head. There's an aroma of chocolate, coffee, and tobacco. It's the taste of bittersweet chocolate, espresso, and kind of some charcoal type stuff. This is a fairly dry beer, and as I said, it's a big beer. Sounds like a good after dinner beer to sip in the study. Yes. Yeah. Well, we'll sip in the quiet end. Yes. Did you see what they're doing down here? What are they doing down here? Well, I was talking to Joe, the bartender, and he said once we're allowed indoor seating again, he's putting up a dartboard. Ah. And I said, geez, Joe, of course, I don't like darts. Well, because you only have one working eye, so yeah. your depth perception's off. Well, there was none. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy if I hit the wall. Right, right. But he's convinced that it's going to help restart his business once uh, things get going again. Well, I hope it does, because a lot of people that own bars and restaurants are certainly having a rough time right now. Well, that's for sure. Yeah, but you have to go out and get that takeout beer and that takeout food to keep supporting and tip large. You got it. All right. Why don't you go ahead and start this? It's a long story, but I think it's pretty easy to follow once you know the characters. Well, that's the problem. But it is a complex (laughs) story. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. There's a few characters, and they all have names start with J. Yeah, I think if you just remember the ones that start with J are pretty much shitballs, then you're good. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. And then there's also some of the J's have alternative nicknames. Yeah, we'll get into that. Right. That's pretty easy to follow. So let's go. 50-year-old Tommy Antonakis was a successful businessman, making his money in real estate and insurance sales. When his daughter Kim went missing, Tommy was leading a Long Island firm that sold mainframe computers to major corporations. Kim was Tommy's only child, and she was the center of his universe. He had made and kept a promise to Kim that he would not remarry, even though Kim's mother had remarried. Tommy never brought any women home while Kim lived with him, mostly because he didn't want to make her uncomfortable or to have her get attached to someone who wouldn't be around consistently. Kind of a defeatist attitude. Yeah, but you know, people make these sacrifices for their children, sometimes unnecessarily. Yes, they do. But the point here, very devoted dad. He would do anything Absolutely, for his princess. So Kim was born in Brooklyn in November of 1974, and Tommy gave her most anything she wanted because he felt guilty about divorcing her mom when Kim was just one year old. After he moved out of their apartment, Tommy spoke to Kim every day on the phone. By the time she was in kindergarten, he had her spend weekends with him. And on Friday nights, they ordered Chinese food, Then, Saturday morning, they'd get up and cook breakfast together. So this was a good father-daughter relationship. It seems to be. And I I guess 
the divorce might not have been too acrimonious because they seem to be able to share custody. Now for Kim's first communion, and then later on for her Sweet Sixteen party, Tommy threw extravagant parties for his daughter. In late 1993, which was just over a year before Kim disappeared, Tommy had agreed to let Kim move into her own apartment. That was a big stretch for him. So the two of them went to look at places together. Tommy wanted her to live in an apartment that was safe. Kim wanted to have a second bedroom so that her mom, Marlene, could stay with her when she came from Florida to visit. Kim's portion of the rent wasn't a lot, but it was enough to give her some responsibility for her living expenses. And Tommy tried to instill a strong work ethic in Kim. So she knew that she had to work hard, but at the same time she knew she wouldn't have to struggle. She also knew there was a place waiting for her in her father's company if she decided to go that way. So this is pretty secure. Yeah. At least financially. She had her life pretty much set up for her. And she was in school. where She was doing some classes. Yep. She ended up renting a two-bedroom ground floor apartment in a three-story home. Her landlord was an elderly guy who had retired from the military and spent most of his days looking out over the neighborhood. And Tommy liked that. He also rented a parking space in a basement garage right across the street for Kim, and that was so she wouldn't have to park far away and be out walking at night. And also, as extra precautions, Tommy gave Kim a cell phone, a beeper, got an alarm installed on her car, and even bought her a pit bull puppy. <laughs> So he was covering all the bases, he believed, which makes it all the more sad. So it was pretty unusual back then to own a cell phone. This is the 90s. Yeah, early 90s, early to mid 90s. Yep. But he was well off and Tommy felt like these things were reassuring for him. He could sleep at night thinking his daughter was safe, even though she was out on her own. Yeah, what was the name of that pit bull in the uh, Quentin Tarantino movie about the Manson murders? The movie was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. What was Brad Pitt's dog's name? I don't remember his name, but he was very well trained. She was a tough girl. Yeah, we were impressed with that dog. So if if she had a pit bull like that, I'd feel really safe. Yeah, I think that takes a lot of work to train a dog that well. But once Kim was out on her own, she still kept in close contact with her dad. They still talked on the phone several times a week, and they ate lunch together at a Brooklyn diner at least once a week. Kim was really attractive. She had this long, curly, dark hair, a really cute face, and just this outgoing, bubbly type of personality. She had many admirers, and she'd had a few steady boyfriends. But she just wanted to have fun, go to work, and get her education. So she'd broken a few hearts, not to be cruel to anyone, but just because she was young and hadn't found anyone she wanted to get really serious with. And when she went through these relationships, she was learning that some guys really couldn't tolerate rejection, and they often became jealous and possessive. And I'd have to say, as someone who used to have a bad picker-outer, that she did, because she picked some really not great guys. She was really dating guys that were trouble, for the most part. Yeah, well, that's because you ladies always want to rescue us. Yeah, yeah. That's why I say that I used to be that way, so that it doesn't look like I'm judging her. I'm just saying that's what was going on. She was only 20. Yes. Now, one of her recent boyfriends was a guy named Jay. Kim had been attracted to him in the beginning because he was charming and good-looking. Well, that's all you need. (laughs) Now, they had recently broken up, but they still had an off-and-on physical relationship. Yeah, so I take that to mean they had sex once in a while. Well, that's what it means. When you say physical relationship, I take that to mean sex. Yeah. They were not playing baseball together. No. No. So Kim had met Jay through April's live-in boyfriend, Josh Torres. April was a friend of hers. And Jay, whose full name was actually Julio Negron, really fell in love with Kim. She was sweet to him, never knocking him for growing up poor and being unemployed. So he was kind of a loser. He wasn't really doing much, and she was doing a lot. But at the same time, she had a lot of advantages he didn't have, and she realized that. But she didn't fall in love with Jay. She was still seeing other people, which upset him. So he was losing what he saw as the best thing in his life, and he'd hoped that their relationship would get serious. But then Kim had told him that she wanted to date other guys, and that was the end of that. Yeah. Now Jay tried to be cool about it, 
But one time he ran into Kim with another guy and he went crazy. This new guy was Sean, and he was a drug dealer from the Lower East Side. Really had a tendency for the bad boys, yeah. So she really liked the bad boys. Certainly if you're doing a fair amount of clubbing, you're going to get exposed to a lot of that type of guy. Yes. Sean lived in Alphabet City, which was infamous for drugs and for prostitution. Although he did live in a very violent world, Kim kind of fooled herself, thinking she wasn't at risk because she wasn't a drug user. But after a few months with Sean, she moved on. He had refused to stop seeing other women, and Kim didn't want to deal with that, even though she did have feelings for him. So that's why they broke up. So she and Jay broke up because Kim was continuing to see guys, and then she and Sean break up because Sean's continuing to see girls. Yes, but I also see a lot of other reasons why she should have broken up with these guys. Well, yeah. Yeah. So it was Tuesday, February 28th, 1995, and Kim went to her classes in business administration at the College of Staten Island. That afternoon, she worked at Amelia Interiors, which was a furniture business, where she did some filing and some basic accounting work. In the early hours of Wednesday, March 1st, 1995, Kim went out dancing with her good friend Liz. These two loved to dance to salsa and more contemporary music, like the rap songs of the notorious B.I.G. and Tupac. Like other young people, Kim and Liz didn't start their evening out until after one in the morning. God, I've had three good hours of sleep by then. (laughs) They got together at 9.30 in the evening and spent about three hours chatting, doing their hair, doing their makeup, getting their nails ready, picking out clothes. So, it's a production. Yes. So, between dances, the girls drank some beer. Liz asked Kim about her house guests, which were April, her boyfriend Josh, and their son, who was about two years old. It had been two weeks since April, Josh, and the little boy had moved into Kim's spare bedroom. Kim had offered them the room while their apartment floors were being refinished. So, this wasn't unlike Kim, according to people who knew her. While her father did spoil her quite a bit, she was always generous, and she shared her good fortune with her friends. Well, I think that's pretty nice of her. Very nice. Two adults and a two-year-old? Yes. And Josh was this unemployed guy who was not the greatest. Well, we got a lot of those unemployed, not-so-great guys. Yeah, we do. She's 20. She's excited to be independent. She'd been living alone for over a year. But she is still enjoying the newness of making her own decisions, such as staying out as late as she liked. Now that night, Kim danced with Liz, but neither of them danced with any men. Then around four in the morning, they decided they'd had enough and they left the club together. Yeah, so Kim got into her slightly used Honda Civic her father had given her, and she headed home. She drove Liz home first, and then she told Liz that she was going straight to her place. She had school and work that day, so she wanted to get a few hours sleep. But while Kim and Liz had been preparing for their night out at 11.30 p.m. on Tuesday, February 28th, these small-time criminals, Nick Labretti and Jose Joey Negron, were plotting Kim's kidnapping. A guy known as KQ, a really stupid nickname standing for King Quality, called up Nick (laughs) that I know. Called up Nick that evening and told him this was the night Kim had gone out dancing. So Nick and Joey drove over to Kim's apartment and they parked down the street and just waited in the dark for their victim. So it was an ambush. So this KQ is the mastermind behind this? So I would think he knew of her, knew of her family, right? Yeah. Why else would he nominate her to be kidnapped? Of course, and we'll get to that. But yeah, he was behind it, and the two that actually did it were Nick and Joey. Yes. So they're sitting in their car. They got their duct tape. They got some medical gauze pads, a beeper, and a loaded handgun. All the essentials. That's what you need, right? So they're waiting for Kim's 94 white Honda Accord to show up. Now, guys like Nick and Joey and KQ were known as mutts to the local police. And this nickname came about because the police felt like they were dog catchers chasing after these guys who ran in packs and who could be very dangerous when cornered. Mutts never seemed to stay locked up for long, so the job of the police was often frustrating. On this particular night, Joey and KQ were out on probation, 
and Nick was out on bail. Three fine, upstanding citizens. Yeah, you see what I mean? She had some really shady people around her. So Nick was just 19, but he'd been a criminal for years already. In 1994, Nick and two other armed guys broke into the window of a house in Brooklyn in the morning at 9 a.m., broad daylight. There were two women and two children in the house at the time, and of course they were terrified when they saw these guys bust in. And Nick put a gun in one of the hysterical woman's mouth and threatened to pull the trigger. And this was as her four-year-old son was right there screaming and crying. He then put his gun up to the four-year-old's face. Can you believe that? To try and get the mother to tell him where her valuables and money were. So this guy had no boundaries, no ethics. If you're going to do that, what wouldn't you do, really? Well, yeah. Yeah. Unless they're breaking into somebody's mansion. This neighborhood, there's not going to be a lot of stuff worth stealing from that home. Right. But these guys are scumbags. You know, they're not working at all or even really trying to work. Yeah. They might just be hanging out and deciding, yeah, it'd be kind of cool. Let's go rob somebody. Yeah. And for the most part, they were living off of their girlfriends. But Nick and his cronies were not very careful or skilled. Their break-in had been witnessed, actually, by two police officers. <laughs> yeah. So they were caught running down the block and they were arrested. They were charged with robbery and possession of weapons. So this was a serious crime, and he could have gotten 25 years in prison. But Nick got out on just $1,000 bail after his mother hired this really excellent defense attorney. So he didn't even spend one night in jail. So it's just really scary to me that someone that would hold a gun to a four-year-old's face or to his mother in front of him just got out and didn't even spend the night in jail. That's a travesty. And as you can imagine, the victims of this home invasion were terrified when they learned that the man who had held a gun to their heads was now free. They ended up leaving the country, actually, because they didn't feel safe in their own home anymore. They were offered a restraining order, but what good is that? Zero. Against someone like this? No. Joey was 26 years old. His self-given nickname was N.I. for Negron Incorporated. Comes up with these names. Jeez. These idiots do. He got this from the famous Murder Incorporated Ice Pick Killers for Hire in Prohibition Era Brooklyn. He and Nick were kidnappers for hire, mostly kidnapping members of drug dealers' families and then holding them for ransom. These are often people who would not like to call the police. So sure. So they ended up paying the ransoms. Still risky business. Risky business. And I'll bet it's not that lucrative. No, I mean, how many times are you going to get away with that before right. you get killed by the drug dealers? Yeah. But the plan to take Kim began about a month earlier. KQ was with his friend who went by BQ in his girlfriend's <laughs> car. They passed by a car dealership and KQ pointed out this Infinity luxury car. This was a $45,000 car and KQ had no job and no money. So he told BQ about a plan he had to kidnap Kim and ask her rich father for money. He said this would be his big payday. That's true. Now he can buy that infinity. Well, he thought so, but of course that didn't happen. KQ is 22. Back when he was 17, he had become what is called a chicken hawk. KQ would go up to boys, little kids, 7 to 10-year-olds, mostly poor neighborhoods, ask them if they wanted to make $20. And then very often the boys said yes and KQ would drive them into Manhattan and sell them to pedophiles for $200. What a sweetheart. Isn't that awful? In 1989, KQ was arrested for promoting prostitution, but he got off with no jail time and five years probation. And I don't know all the details of what he was doing with what kid at the time he got arrested, but promoting prostitution, these were children. Shouldn't it be more than just promoting prostitution? I would think kidnapping, sexual abuse. Yeah, these are little kids. Yeah. But like you said, no jail time, five years probation. So I can see why the cops would be frustrated with these people. Yeah. Then in 1991, he was arrested for rape and unlawful imprisonment of an underage girl. He took a plea this time and spent only six days in jail. In 1992, KQ was busted for carrying a gun. And he got 18 months in jail for that charge and three years probation. So I think that's the longest he was ever in jail. 
You know, the plan to kidnap Cam was fairly simple. However, kidnapping is a stupid crime, and the perpetrators usually get caught. But KQ and BQ thought they had something on their side to protect them, and that was witchcraft. They had been raised in the Catholic Church, but had begun practicing Santeria, where they danced, chanted, and sacrificed animals in order to drink their blood. So Nick and Joey waited for hours for Kim to get home from her night of clubbing. They watched as her headlights came up behind them and passed their parked car. Kim used her garage door opener as she drove down to her basement garage. And as the door finished opening, Nick and Joey ran inside. Kim parked her car, shut off the engine, and then the two men grabbed her, pinned down her arms, and covered her mouth. So Joey pushed Kim down across her own front seat, and Kim fought really hard. She kicked and she clawed at her attackers. She had to have been terrified. One of her gold seashell earrings flew off her ear and landed on the garage floor, and she clawed so hard that she broke some of her long, freshly manicured fingernails. She actually dug into the zipper of Joey's black army fatigue jacket and ripped out some of the metal zipper teeth, embedding them in the skin beneath one fingernail. That had to hurt. But Nick wrapped duct tape around Kim's head to silence her screams and to cover her eyes. He bound her wrists and her legs, leaving her helpless, even as she fought so hard. Using her car keys, they opened the Honda's trunk and they threw her into it. Nick drove and backed out of the garage onto the street, then closed the garage door behind them. So Joey followed the Honda in his Nissan, and Nick was in the car with Kim. And Kim had to find it difficult to breathe, but she continued screaming beneath the tape. It's really her only hope is for someone to hear her. She couldn't move, she couldn't see, she couldn't use her hands at all, of course. And the tape over her eyes was really covering her ears quite a bit. So she couldn't hear either, at least not well. But Kim did not give up easily. She was wearing the type of boots worn in that grunge era, the big blocky Doc Martin type of boots. And she kicked the metal of the trunk as hard as she could over and over, making loud banging sounds. She rocked and kicked and ended up knocking off her remaining earring. Nick wasn't really phased too much by this noise. He just turned up the music in the car to drown out Kim's kicks. He drove into Queens and parked out in front of a two-story wood-framed home, and Joey pulled up and parked behind him. Over a month earlier, Joey had broken into a basement window at 7808 86th Avenue. He had found a key on a hook by the front door and stole it. It was a house on a quiet street. It was unoccupied but still had water and electricity, even though nobody had lived there in months. Yeah, so after looking around to make sure there were no potential witnesses... Joey opened up Kim's trunk and lifted her out of it. He carried her into the dark house, then into the basement, and onto a wooden chair they already had set up there. They had the back of the chair up against the round metal pole in the middle of the basement, surrounded by just the kind of junk that some people collect in their basement, broken, moldy furniture and just junk. So this wasn't like a finished, nice basement. Out of sight, out of mind, right? Yeah, so it was a cold, dark basement. And we just put things down there that we don't want to look at. And this is March in New York, so it's cold. Likely to be. So Nick cut the tape off of Kim's hands and then pulled her hands behind her back and the chair back. He handcuffed her wrists behind her and the metal pole. So there's no way she was going to be able to free herself. Joey took off her boots and threw them aside so she couldn't stomp her feet to make noise. And it was super cold in that basement. The heat was set to run upstairs when the temperature went below 55 degrees, but the basement easily got below freezing at night. Now they took her beeper, as well as her gold bracelet and a ring. Kim had a large gold cross with red stones around her neck, which the two mutts planned to pawn. As they were robbing Kim, she continued to try to scream for help. Joey lifted the tape and Kim spoke. She didn't scream, but she asked them why they were mugging her. And they just laughed. They said, yeah, your father owes us some money. Yeah, so she couldn't see these guys, but she fired back at them that she knew her father didn't owe them money, and they didn't care. But they were worried that she might be heard by a neighbor. So Nick filled her mouth with gauze and put more tape over it, and then they just left her there in the basement, handcuffed to a pole on a chair in her stocking feet. And she couldn't hear them leaving. 
she didn't know where she was or who even had kidnapped her. But here she was alone in the dark and the cold, not able to see or move. It's just terrifying to imagine. It is. And and these guys didn't think it out much, did they? No. Very incompetent as well as evil. No, No blanket or anything to keep warm. No. So Nick followed Joey in Kim's car, and they parked Kim's car on another suburban street a ways away. Nick parked down the block, and before walking away, Joey threw the used duct tape roll over a fence into a random backyard. Then Nick got into the Nissan with Joey, carrying Kim's shopping bag and her purse. And on their way back to Queens, Nick went through Kim's purse. They took her cash, her wallet, and her cell phone, and then they just tossed the purse out the window. They tried to use her cell phone, but a recording told them that the fraud protection feature had been engaged because they didn't know the code. So they couldn't use the phone without that security code. Still, Nick tried to get the phone to work for him. As soon as he hit send, the phone set out a signal that was relayed electronically to the customer service department of the cell phone company. So this relay of a 40-second call made at 5.52 a.m., was recorded into the computerized system. Once in Queens, Joey stopped nearby his house to use a payphone. He dialed KQ's beeper, left the payphone number, and hung up, and then minutes later, the payphone rang, and Joey answered. The party's over, Joey said into the phone, and this was the signal they'd agreed on. That means that Kim had been taken and tied up and left, so they were ready to go through with their plan to get money from her dad. But while they were on their way, Joey had second thoughts about the way they had left Kim's car. So at 7 a.m., it's light out, they drove back to the white Honda. Joey took some towels and cleaning solution and wiped down Kim's car, including the door handles, the steering wheel, and the console. Then about 8 a.m., Joey dropped Nick at his Brooklyn home, and he drove home, tired from this very eventful night. Both men fell asleep in their warm beds, and Kim was sitting in this freezing, strange basement alone. With no food or drink. No blanket, nothing. On Wednesday, the next day, was a cold day with cold rain. It was also Ash Wednesday, which is the first day of Lent in the Christian Church. It's considered a solemn reminder of human mortality and the need for reconciliation with God commonly observed with ashes and fasting. Later that morning, the clouds broke up and the air warmed up to 40 degrees, quite balmy. At 10.30 in the morning, KQ called BQ at his sister's house. BQ knew that KQ had talked about kidnapping Kim, but he had not realized how serious KQ had been. KQ told him how Nick and Joey had abducted and tied up Kim, leaving her in an empty house. He told BQ that they planned to let Kim go after her father gave them money, make that ransom payment. So later that day, KQ went to a payphone and called Tommy Antonakis' Staten Island home. The answering machine picked up. So here's where you're going to hear how stupid these people really were. (laughs) I had to reread this a few times. Yeah, why don't you explain what they did? KQ heard a man's voice say hello. Then he moved the phone from his ear and held it up to a microcassette recorder. He pushed play, and a high-pitched voice played a message. It was a speeded-up recording, so they would be able to hide the voice. I guess he'd sound like uh, one of the chipmunks singing. Yes, exactly, right. Hugged your daughter lately, the voice asked. $75,000, your money or your daughter. Yeah, so just to make this clear, while he was playing this, it hadn't even gotten to the beep yet. It was just... Tommy's recording, so of course it wasn't recording anything. Not one little millimeter. And they would do this over and over again, not just the once. Because the answering machine continued to play the outgoing message. Yeah. KQ is playing this tape into another recorded voice. Yep. Then when he put the phone back to his ear, he doesn't hear anything. I know. And wouldn't you think maybe it's the answering machine? Because it's the 90s, everybody had an answering machine. Yep. He waited a minute, hung up, confused, tried again, and did the same stupid thing again. Just couldn't for the life of him understand why Kim's father wasn't speaking to him. Dumb. So at the house behind the one where Kim was a prisoner, a woman named Jeanette Montalvo 
had this small dog who was running around and barking in the direction of where Kim was. So she brought her dog in and he quieted down. Back on Long Island, a resident noticed Kim's white Honda parked on her street. Because the neighborhood was near the Southern State Parkway, it wasn't unusual for commuters to leave their cars parked on that street while they carpooled into the city. So that day, the resident wasn't concerned. That afternoon, Tommy Antonakis's beeper went off. It was his girlfriend, who was also the manager of Amelia Interiors, where Kim was working part-time. And when he called her back, she told him that Kim had not shown up for work that day. She had received a call from April, the friend who was living there, telling her that Kim had never come home the night before. So Kim was supposed to work from noon to 4.30 that day, and at 12.30, the manager had paged her, but she never got a response from Kim. So Tommy, he was worried right away. Kim would not just skip work without calling anyone. So he hung up the phone, left work right away, and drove over to Kim's apartment building. Jill, what did you put in the blender? My Bluetooth earbuds. If I hear another commercial, I'm going to scream. That's a little extreme, don't you think? I can't help you with other podcasts, but all of our True Crime Brewery episodes now come with commercial-free versions for our Tie Grabber subscribers. Well, I know. My hate for ads is what motivated me to give Tie Grabber members that ad-free option. If you subscribe at tiegrabber.com, you get to listen to all of our new episodes commercial-free. And this is in addition to our bonus episodes every month. Plus, you get some great TCB swag mailed to you when you join. Okay, I get it. At least TCB listeners can avoid ads. Just turn off the damn blender. You're going to wake up the whole neighborhood. Okay. On the way, he was actually pulled over for speeding, but the patrolman let him get off with a warning after he explained what was going on with his daughter. It was just a few minutes after 4 p.m. when he arrived at Kim's apartment. Josh, April's boyfriend, answered the door and introduced himself. It was the first time that they had met, but Kim had told her dad about Josh and April staying with her in the spare room. April was at work, because she worked, and Josh was at home, supposedly caring for their son, but not a lot of caring going on. So Josh said that Kim hadn't been home. She had called the night before to say that she was going out, and they hadn't heard from her since. Josh also said that he'd been making calls to all of Kim's friends. He said that he had made between 40 and 50 calls. The only person who had not returned his calls, he pointed out, was an ex-boyfriend of Kim's whose nickname was Psycho. So that's not encouraging. (laughs) That is not. So Tommy's pretty concerned once he hears that nickname. Scary. Josh said that Psycho was a bad guy who happened to be in love with Kim. Then he also added that Kim had been afraid of Psycho. He was living up to his name, maybe. Now, Tommy had never heard of this guy. However, he's now afraid that Kim had been stalked before she went missing. Josh said that Kim had gone dancing with her friend Liz, and Kim had driven Liz home at four in the morning. Yeah, but they checked and Kim's car was not in her garage, so Tommy just immediately went to the police station. He was a businessman, kind of one of these get-things-done guys. He wasn't one to wait around. He was going to make things happen. And plus, this is the most important thing in his life, his daughter. So Tommy spoke with an officer who did write down his story, but this officer didn't see the situation as necessarily urgent, and that was frustrating for Tommy. The officer explained that the NYPD guidelines called for a 24-hour waiting period before filing a missing persons report. And the only exceptions were for children under 16, handicapped adults, those in need of medication, or anyone considered to be a danger to herself or to others. Kim didn't meet any of these criteria, but Tommy was not going to let this go. He was persistent. Detective Phil Tricola spoke with Tommy. Tommy told him that his daughter did not run off. He knew her well enough to know that something was pretty wrong. After convincing the detective, a missing persons report was filled out. Tommy gave the detective Kim's friend Liz's phone number. 
she was the last known person to be with Kim. So then Liz told the detective about her night out with Kim. They'd had a couple of beers, but Kim was not at all impaired. Liz told the detective that Kim had some tattoos on her body, a scorpion and a nude couple. She was also able to describe Kim's clothing and jewelry down to the smallest detail. Sure, because they'd gotten ready together. I'm sure they'd talked about what they were going to wear and all that, and then they'd spent the evening together. Yeah, I mean, she knows. She knew everything. So Tommy left the station after dark, and he stopped at Liz's place and asked if anyone had followed Kim from the club. Liz said she hadn't seen anyone. So then he went back to Kim's apartment with Liz, and Josh and April were there with their little son. Again, Josh brought up that Psycho had not called him back. He said that Psycho was a gangster who should definitely be investigated. And while Tommy was there, Josh called Kim's friend and ex-boyfriend, Jay. When he hung up, he said that Jay had not seen Kim. So then Josh volunteered to show Tommy some hidden places where car thieves often took vehicles when they stole them. Maybe they'd come across Kim's car. So Tommy and Josh went out in Tommy's car to look for Kim's car. Josh took them to a shopping center and lots of quiet streets, and they even looked in overgrown lots, but Kim's car was not found in any of these places. When he returned to the apartment, Kim's old friend from grade school was there, and she was super upset. She brought her fiancé with her to help in the search. And she wasn't really very happy when she saw the kind of people that Kim had been hanging around. They seemed kind of shady. So she was really worried about her old friend. Tommy, a man who wanted to get things done, had already called his attorney and the FBI. And around 8 p.m., he asked Josh for Kim's spare keys. One of those keys opened that big garage door. So Tommy went inside that garage and turned on the light, and that's when he saw the gold seashell earring on the floor. Josh ran over and picked up the earring. And Tommy wasn't even sure if it was Kim's. But if it was, they would know that she had made it home, at least into the garage, before she disappeared. When Liz arrived at Kim's place, she recognized the earring, and she told Tommy that Kim had worn it the night before. She was absolutely certain. She'd already described the earrings to the detective who had called her. So Tommy went back to Kim's apartment, and he called Detective Phil Tricola. And the detective told them, Stay out of the garage, I'm coming right over. Don't mess up my crime scene. Exactly. After Tommy hung up, he told everyone what the detective had said. Josh said he was going to his old neighborhood, still to look for Kim's car. He claimed to know a lot of chop shops located there. But when the detective arrived, Josh was gone. Tommy showed the detective the earring, and Liz confirmed that it was one of the earrings Kim had worn out the night before. And Tommy also told the detective about Psycho. Liz said that Kim was afraid of him. He was a gangster, and he was obsessed with Kim. So the detective started to agree with Tommy that it looked like Kim could be in some serious trouble here. Yeah, so Detective Tricola canvassed the neighborhood, and he spoke to pretty much all of the neighbors. But the problem was it was 4 a.m., and everyone had been asleep when Kim got there. No one said that they'd heard or seen anything suspicious. Tommy gave the detective Kim's address book, and Tricola put out a stolen car bulletin so that police all over the city would at least be looking out for her white Honda Accord. The City Department of Sanitation and the Department of Transportation were contacted, too, but her car had not been towed. No one had used her American Express card or her ATM card. And, you know, lots of times, if it's a carjacking, they'll immediately drive to an ATM and take money out. Well, sure. And use those cards. Mm Mm-hmm. The Port Authority police checked airport parking, too, since many car thieves would just dump a car there if they're not going to sell it for parts. So Psycho could not be reached by phone, but Tommy went to his place, which was in Brighton Beach, and they looked around for Kim's car in Psycho's garage and on the streets. He asked people on the street if they had seen Kim, even carrying her picture around with him. And he continued these efforts all night long and really found out nothing. Nada. No. About 5 a.m. on Thursday, Tommy returned to Kim's apartment. He let himself in. Jay was asleep on the couch, and he woke up and introduced himself. 
Tommy said, go back to sleep. Then Tommy returned to Staten Island, alone and miserable. He checked his answering machine. No messages. He slept for a couple of hours, showered, and then was back to Kim's apartment by noontime. Tommy was directing Kim's friends in the search. Jay told everyone that Kim would be okay, but he should have no way to know that. Exactly. Well, when Tommy's brother arrived with a group of his friends to help in the search, Jay started joking behind their backs that they looked like mob guys. And he discussed this with Josh, and they agreed that Tommy and his brother must be members of the Gotti crew. So they did believe that to a certain extent, but then I also think that they were using that to their advantage as we get deeper into this. But Detective Tricola was really concerned that maybe Kim had been carjacked. He contacted the cell phone company, and they told him that Kim's phone had been used near the JFK Hilton Hotel after she had disappeared. But wouldn't carjackers have used her credit cards or something before they'd been reported stolen? What would be the purpose of carjacking? I was about to ask that. Right. They didn't drive her to an ATM. Her cards hadn't been used. So it was just an unusual crime, not what he was used to seeing. And because of what Josh and Jay had been telling him, Tommy was really focused on Psycho as the suspect. He told the detective that Psycho had his daughter and gave him a picture of Psycho that had been found in Kim's apartment. So Psycho was pale and blonde with really short hair and big prominent ears. In the picture, he was smiling and holding a bunch of $100 bills. So another one of these guys that sees himself as this gangster. But Tricola took the photo to the police station in Brighton Beach, where Psycho lived, and he showed it to a detective who he knew there. Yeah, and the detective immediately recognized Psycho. Turns out he's a 23-year-old guy who had been born in Russia and brought to the United States as a child by his parents. And at this point... Psycho was out on $5,000 bail for the statutory rape of a 12-year-old. Got to be a better term than statutory for, I mean, this is a 12-year-old. Maybe if you're like a 16-year-old. Well, because you're looking at statutory as making it less of a crime, but it's not necessarily. Psycho was a member of the street gang Together Forever. The gang was a group of Russian and Hispanic youths who liked to hang out on Coney Island. And they're suspected of selling guns and dealing drugs. Sort of the usual gang things. Yeah, so it just seems like everyone that Kim hung around as a guy were just really awful guys. I don't know what she was thinking. She had all these nice guys at college that she wouldn't date, so she really had this thing for the bad boys, I guess, to the extreme. So Detective Tricola and his partner went out and they did pick up Psycho on the street, but he didn't seem nervous at all. He was a little bit evasive about how he knew Kim, but he was a criminal. He claimed that he was a stockbroker. He didn't have an alibi, but Tricola really wasn't thinking that he had anything to do with Kim's disappearance. They would continue to check him out, but he just didn't seem like he was involved to them. Yeah, so Tricola went back to Tommy and said, Nah, this psycho's not your guy. He would continue to check on Psycho, but he wanted to move on to the investigation in other directions as well. Well, and he should, yeah. Yeah, and you can't focus on just that one. No. Not with the little bit that they have. Sure. Tommy went back to Kim's phone book and made some more calls. Still, he was disappointed that Psycho wasn't the key to finding Kim. Josh persisted in pointing the finger at Psycho. He told Tommy that he had a friend who'd seen a car full of Russian guys driving down Kim Street on the night she disappeared. Now, Tommy got the friend's name and phone number. Josh and Jay left, saying they were going to look for Kim's car at more chop shops. Is that all there is in this neighborhood? Chop no, shops. No, they were making that up, we're going to find out, Dick. Yeah, I Yeah, know. okay. So when the fiancé of Kim's old school friend volunteered to go with Josh and Jay, they refused to take him with them, which was a little weird. Josh said that they could cover more ground if the fiancé took his own car. But, you know, the fiancé didn't know the neighborhoods or any chop shops, so... It didn't make any sense, but they didn't want him with them, which is important to note. So at 9.30 that night, the resident of the house near where Kim was imprisoned was having trouble with her little dog barking again. The dog had been barking constantly for two days like someone was in the empty house. So I personally would call the police and say, something's going on over there. Can you check out that house? 
Yeah, got a, a dog that's been alerted to something. Yeah, but she didn't. She called her dog. He didn't come back in, but he was laying silently on his back, almost as if someone had done something to him. But after several minutes, he snapped out of it and seemed fine. Still, she didn't do anything about it. So KQ and BQ went out that night to buy themselves some pot. Then they went to a payphone and called Tommy Antonakis's home phone number. KQ played the ransom tape again to the answering machine message. Same thing he'd done before. It didn't even occur to him to make sure that someone was on the line. So it should have been time for them to get the ransom money and let Kim go. But they couldn't understand why Kim's father would not respond to them. So BQ was getting a bad feeling, but KQ mocked Tommy and laughed about his concern for his daughter. So he seemed like the rougher of the bunch. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So BQ contacted Joey to make sure that he was taking care of Kim. He said, you know, you need to keep her warm and give her food and water. And Joey said, oh yeah, she's fine. But he was lying, telling BQ that he was even taking care of her twice daily. In reality, Kim had not been fed or even given any water for two days now, and mostly because he was afraid to be seen at the house, Joey was. So as KQ laughed at Tommy and the police looking for Kim, Joey recorded everything they were saying, thinking this would be his insurance if they got caught. Their voices were muffled because the recorder was in Joey's pocket, but it was audible. You could hear what they were saying. Now that night, the temperatures in Queens went down to 25 degrees. The little dog in the house near Kim had stopped barking, but the dog's owner could see the side windows of the house. And as she was washing dishes and looking out the window, she thought she saw a candle or a flashlight on the first floor. But she ignored it. Again. She also heard a strange sound coming from the house, like a humming or a muffled cry. She couldn't explain the sound, but she knew that some people on the block drank and did drugs. Now, the way she saw it, it was none of her business. So she ignored the sound and went to bed. Now, she heard the gate to the vacant house open during the night, but didn't do anything about that either. You would think at the very least she would call the police to do a check, or if she knew the owner of the house, let them know to check it out. So I'm really disappointed with that person. We know that Kim was alone in that vacant basement. She could only breathe through this small space that was open between her blindfold and her gag. Her mouth was filled with gauze and taped shut with duct tape. Also, you know, her hearing was muffled and her eyes were completely in the dark. And on her feet, she was only wearing thin stockings. So it's really impossible to imagine what she's going through. This is two days. And when Kim did test for any chance of escape, she found her restraints were really solid. Her body ached and she couldn't move at all. And the metal of the handcuffs was digging into her hands. She couldn't even get one hand free. She was completely stuck there. She tried to make noise, and all she could make was that humming whining noise that the neighbor had heard and ignored. So with no jacket or blanket, Kim's body was really losing heat. She was getting to a dangerous situation here. Yeah, her hands and feet were cold, and then they got numb. Her body worked to keep her vital organs warm as her extremities vasoconstricted. So the body's going to start shutting down soon. Yeah, well, first her skin turned pale and waxy. It was painful at first, and then there's no feeling. Now, when her body temperature moved from the normal 98, 99 degrees to below 95, Kim started to enter hypothermia. Her body shivered and shook, causing pain and spasms in an attempt to generate heat. As time passed, she would have lost track. In constant dark, time was impossible to track. Her eyes burned from the contact lens. Her eyes burned from the contact lenses as her body dehydrated. She was also without food or water, so she's hungry and thirsty. And then to further worsening the humiliation, and how cold she felt, she had to empty her bladder. So she wet herself in her clothing. Right, which would make her colder, though, to have the fluid on her. So on Thursday, the outdoor temperature reached 40 degrees. The furnace in the vacant house came on, warming the upper house to 55 degrees, but warmth in the basement was minimal, although it was better than it was in the middle of the night. 
Kim was awake that day and worked hard to make her cries for help. She heard a dog barking outside, and that gave her hope that someone would respond. She didn't know that a neighbor had heard her muffled cries and just gone ahead with her day as usual. Thursday night, Kim entered the late stages of hypothermia. Her body temperature was likely at this point, what, below 90 degrees? Most likely. So how would being that cold affect her body? What would happen? Well, her brain wouldn't be working so well. So she'd become confused, disoriented. She'd become lethargic, more and more sleepy. Her pulse slowed, her breathing would slow. Now by Friday, the next morning, she would not have felt the cold anymore. As her body temperature fell, she'd start to lose consciousness. Her pupils in her eyes would become fixed and dilated, and her skin would turn a bluish gray color. Now to the untrained person, Kim would have appeared dead. She was still alive, but her pulse was thready and her breathing slowed. She needs to be intervened with pretty quickly. Yes, it's getting to a point where she won't survive. One thing a lot of us don't know is that a frozen victim is not pronounced dead until the person is warmed and still has no pulse. Now, there are rare stories of hypothermia victims recovering completely after being warmed up slowly. And we hear this about people that drown in, yeah, a, mostly in the lake I think in of, the winter time or something. Right. I think of children that have seemed like they had drowned but are revived. Yes. So Kim was now in a hypothermic coma, but still possibly could have been revived if she had been found that Thursday or Friday morning. The cold had to be kept from the heart because if the heart cools down enough, it can cause ventricular fibrillation, which is a pretty fatal arrhythmia. So if she was warmed with warm fluids and the use of a heart-lung bypass machine, she could be brought back from her condition. But she was just left to die. Yeah, she wasn't saved. Kim was unconscious, so she didn't know that Wayne McCook visited his mother's house at 7808 86th Avenue that Friday morning. He didn't know that anyone was in the house either, of course. He had stopped by, as he always did, on the first Friday of the month to pick up his mother's Social Security check from the mail. So his mom had left the house in 1991 after having health problems, but she was refusing to sell it. She insisted on keeping the electricity on with the thermostat set at 55 degrees. Over a month earlier, Wayne had found a broken basement window and noticed a missing key, but he hadn't reported it and he didn't want to spend the money to change all the locks. So he just picked up the mail and left without going anywhere near the basement. But actually, it was one of the perpetrators who had a key to that house because he'd broken in and He'd been using the vacant house as kind of a hangout and a place to do things. Yeah, a little crash pad type of thing. Yeah, he called it actually the sweet house, I think. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, these guys are just asses. So Detective Tricola was still looking for Kim's car when Tommy told him about what Josh had told him about Psycho and his gang. But when Tricola called Psycho, uh, he was pretty cooperative. Now in the town of Malvern, Residents had seen Kim's white Honda parked on a suburban street for three days. A woman actually called the police to report it, and two policemen showed up, called in the plate, but didn't realize that the car belonged to a missing woman, Kim Antonakis. Yeah, so there had to be some kind of failure there. There had been an alert sent out on finding that car, but I guess because it wasn't reported stolen, that's the only check they did? I'm not sure, but... They didn't figure it out at that point, which maybe if they had, they could have saved Kim. But after Tommy called and notified Kim's mom, Marlene, that Kim was missing, she got on a flight from Florida. Now, it took him two days to notify Kim's mom, which she might have been really pissed off about. But he was hoping to find Kim and spare Marlene the worry if Kim turned up fine. So he picked up Marlene at the airport and they went back to Kim's apartment. At this point, Tommy had asked Josh and April to move out of Kim's place so Marlene could stay there. And once there, of course, Marlene wanted to help find her daughter. But she was pretty happy with what Tommy had done so far. It seemed that he had already done everything possible to bring Kim home. So Marlene, being Marlene, decided to hire a psychic. She believed in psychics. Of course, the detectives were more than skeptical about this. 
They did not like that at all. They thought that this was just a waste of their time. But they went along with it because this poor woman is missing her daughter. They'll do anything. So the psychic said many generalized things, like that Kim had been taken out west and that she was tied to a bed in a vacant house. So part of this would end up being correct, but the psychic wasn't any help in actually finding Kim. You know, if you think about it, they say Kim had been taken out west, but they're on the east coast. So chances are, if she's taken somewhere, it would be west. Yeah, you're already kind of northeast, right? Well, my take on psychics is that it's a skill, that you say these generalized things, you lead people into it. I think it's a total scam. And I know some people believe in it, and that's fine. They could be right and I could be wrong. But this woman didn't help. Well, I I think you need to have some talent in being able to pick things out. Oh, yeah. I think that's how the con women and men do it. Yeah. So you have to have some talent at that. You do. So Marlene went back to the group of friends and family who were searching for Kim and told them what the psychic had told her. When she said that Kim was tied up in a vacant house, Josh and Jay kind of panicked. Their eyes met, but no one in the room seemed to notice that. Both of these guys tried to act unaffected, but at this point they had to be worried. And you know why? Because Josh and Jay were KQ and BQ. So we've got Josh, KQ, Jay, BQ, then we have Nick and Joey. And Josh and Jay were the ones responsible for directing Nick and Joey to abduct Kim for ransom. KQ was actually the so-called mastermind. But Tommy had not responded to their several demands for money, and they started becoming paranoid, worrying that Tommy's so-called mob friends were going to whack them. Josh and Jay made excuses and said they had to run to the store, but they really planned to meet with Joey and Nick, because now now they're getting worried. Well, yeah, it's interesting because they're thinking that the psychic has the answer, you know? Well, they're very superstitious, yeah. Remember well, the Santeria and everything. I, I guess if, if you're generous, you'd say they're superstitious or, or unsophisticated. One could also say stupid. Idiotic. Yeah. Cruel. There's a lot we could say. But Josh had believed that they were outsmarting the detectives. They'd been making these suggestions about Psycho and a Russian gang, pointing Tommy in the direction of suspecting other people. And unwittingly, Tommy was sharing this misleading information with the detectives. But Josh and Jay could not figure out why Tommy didn't talk back to their recorded demands on the phone. They knew Tommy loved his daughter and he had money, so why wasn't he saying anything? They couldn't figure it out, and finally Jay and Josh decided that they needed to let Kim go before things got worse. So Josh borrowed clothing from a friend so he could go into the basement and free Kim, and then change into clean clothing before going back to Kim's apartment. He thought that if he freed her, the case would be dropped for lack of evidence, and maybe they could get out of this whole thing. Uh, That's a little naive. So these four scumbags, they met where but at Dunkin' Donuts to have another meeting. Yeah, Jay and Josh told Nick and Joey what the psychic had said. Like you've pointed out, these are superstitious folks, so they were very concerned about that. And if they were found out, they knew that the penalties would probably include lengthy prison sentences. Well, absolutely. However, moving Kim would be risky, just in and of itself. So Joey told Josh where the house was where they had been keeping Kim. At the house on 86th Avenue, Joey, Josh, and Nick went inside. Using a flashlight, Nick and Josh went down to the basement. When they shined the light on Kim... They could see that something was terribly wrong. Her head was tilted back, and she didn't appear to be breathing. So Josh kicked Kim in her shins really hard with his boots. No response. Nick cut the duct tape around her face. His hand slipped, and he cut her cheek a little bit, but she didn't respond to that either. Josh felt for a pulse and couldn't find one, and Kim just looked completely frozen. But when they went upstairs and told Joey what had happened, he was upset. Josh showed no emotion. Josh and Nick went back to the basement and tried to pick up Kim, but she was frozen to the chair she'd been sitting in. So they decide she must be dead. And Josh yelled at Jay for not checking on her or giving her food and water. And Nick suggested that they take Kim's body along with the chair and dump her somewhere. Now Josh didn't like that idea because he had already decided he needed to burn the house down and that would eliminate any evidence. 
So Josh had taken charge and started giving out orders. They went to a gas station, pretending to have a car that had been out of gas. Josh brought a gas container and filled it. When they returned to the house, all four of them went inside. But Joey said, I'm not going down to that basement. Yeah, so Joey and Jay stayed upstairs in the kitchen, and it was Nick and Josh who took the gas into the basement. They would set the fire, and then Jay and Joey would block the basement door with the refrigerator after they ran up there. And they thought this would delay the firemen from putting out the fire. So Nick removed the handcuffs from Kim's wrists, and Josh took a piece of duct tape from Kim to keep as a souvenir. As Nick held the flashlight on Kim, Josh walked over to her and talked to her, like in a sarcastic, cruel way, is the way I see it. He said, I'm sorry it has to end this way, but life sucks. Shit happens. Then Josh kissed Kim's forehead, stepped back, poured gasoline over her, soaking her hair in her clothing, and he and Nick backed up towards the stairs. Then Josh threw a match at Kim, and the fire flashed and burned a hole into the ceiling pretty quickly, filling the upstairs with smoke. Now, fortunately, Kim had probably not heard Josh. We're pretty sure, right, that she wouldn't have heard. And hopefully she was too far gone to feel any more pain. But we know she was still alive. She was just unconscious, and her body was too frozen and numb to feel anything, we hope. But she did inhale smoke into her lungs and died, so that's how we know she was alive when they set her on fire. Yeah, she was still breathing. Yeah. So as he ran upstairs and out the door... Josh seemed really excited. The four guys pushed the refrigerator against the basement door and took off. Joey drove them away from the house. Josh, or King Quality, KQ, (laughs) smells strongly of gasoline. They drove for a while and dumped the gas container in someone's trash can. Then they went back to Duncan and drove towards Kim's apartment. Then Josh's pager went off. They pulled over to a payphone and Josh called Tommy. Yes, so Tommy, Kim's dad, had a job for Jay and Josh, who he thought were her friends. He asked them to check a motel by the airport for Kim's car, even giving them the address. Josh told Tommy that they would look there, but they drove to see the friend who had loaned them the clothing. They didn't look there. They knew where Kim was. And in that guy's house, Josh changed from his gas-covered clothing. He wanted to wash them right away and he made up a story about how he had gotten the gas on himself. So he left the pants to soak in the water and detergent and washed his boots in the bathtub. Josh and Jay did show up at Kim's apartment just after 2.30 a.m., and they claimed to be tired after searching for hours and not finding any trace of Kim or her car. So Josh used Kim's phone to call his aunt at 2.48 a.m. Josh, Jay, Nick, and Joey now shared this awful secret but at least Josh believed that all the evidence of their crimes was burned to the ground. The others weren't so sure. Well, and they would be correct. There was a neighbor of the burning house. His name is John Cunniff. He had smelled smoke at around 2 in the morning, checked his entire house, didn't find anything, and then went outside. Couldn't see a fire, but the smell of smoke was even more intense outdoors. He walked around the corner following the smell and eventually saw some smoke coming from the first floor window of 7808 86th Avenue. He walked up the driveway and saw more smoke coming from the second floor window. He walked back home then and called 911. So the firemen arrived and they found the front door unlocked. Using fire department's procedure, they did a ventilate and search. This meant removing windows and doors and punching a hole in the roof to let out the smoke. Neighbors had told them that no one lived in the house, but they still needed to do a search. I mean, often homeless people would be found in abandoned buildings, and they may have accidentally started a fire by cooking or using a fireplace. Yeah, that's happened quite a few times. Wasn't there a big case in Boston where firemen were killed? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, homeless people that were trying to stay warm, and they... Accidentally started a fire. Yeah. Yeah. So as they turned the hoses on the center of the house, the fire was extinguished. The dark smoke stopped coming from the windows, and then a thick white steam came from the house. The basement door was blocked by the refrigerator, 
When the firemen managed to move it, smoke poured out into the kitchen. In the basement, as the air cleared, they were met with a horrible sight. There was a human being, charred and slumped in a chair, completely burned from the waist up. They could tell from her lower body that it was probably a woman, but her face was not recognizable. They could see, though, that she'd been gagged and restrained. The basement also smelled strongly of gasoline. It was very obviously arson and likely murder, so the police and fire marshals were called in right away. And this call also alerted the medical examiner's office and the police crime scene unit. So from a section of unburned skin, investigators saw that the body was either a white or Hispanic woman. She had ligature marks on her wrists, and there were pieces of tape residue on her forearms. When the homicide detectives arrived, they were just disgusted by the scene. Now they had seen many dead bodies, but this case was the worst for many of them. They could tell by looking at the scene that someone had poured gasoline on the victim while she was restrained upright in the chair. So this is just a shockingly cruel crime. There were no signs of a stabbing or a shooting, but they would do x-rays to see if she had been killed or tortured before being burned. But then beneath her pants waist, investigators saw Kim's two tattoos, a scorpion on her right hip and then a nude couple on her lower back. Without being able to identify the face, the tattoos were going to be really helpful in identifying her. Detective Tricola was contacted to determine if the body found in the basement was the missing woman, Kim Antonakis. When he heard the description, he knew that this was going to be bad news for Kim's father, Tommy. Coincidentally, Tommy was already at the station when the news came in. Detectives from the crime scene were on their way, but Tricola tried to prepare Tommy for the dreadful news. Tommy showed the detective pictures of his daughter for identification purposes. That was before he learned that his daughter had been burned beyond recognition. Too much for this loving father to absorb. He just fell apart, crying in his hands. He knew he had to go back to Kim's apartment and give Marlene the bad news. Yeah, these poor parents. So investigators needed to re-interview Kim's friends. They called Kim's apartment and asked April, Josh, Jay, and Liz to come down to the station without telling them that Kim was dead or anything. Because homicide investigators like to see the reactions of people when they learn of a death, right? To determine if they seem genuine or they seem guilty, what their reaction is. Oh, yeah. So April was notified of Kim's death when she was alone in an interview room with a detective. And she responded angrily. Mostly, I guess, for not being told on the phone. But still, it was strange. She asked Josh to come into the room to be with her. So Josh came in, and he responded to the news by saying that Kim had been like a sister to him in April. April told the investigators that Kim often went clubbing, and she was admired by a lot of men. She had introduced Kim to Jay, and the two of them had dated. She said that she was in Kim's apartment with Josh and their son on the night Kim disappeared. She and Josh had gone to bed, she said, and they heard Kim's phone ring about 1.30 in the morning. They let the answering machine take that call. Then when April woke up for work the next morning, she saw that Kim's bed had not been slept in, and she knew that Kim had not been home since the night before. So Josh was asked his date of birth so they could do a criminal background check, but he got angry about that. When asked if he had a nickname, he said, yes, it's KQ, and April was his alibi. He had woken up after April left for work, he said, and about one o'clock that Wednesday, April had called him to tell him that Kim had not come home or showed up for work. So then they talked to Jay. Yeah, he told the detectives that his nickname was BQ, because he didn't want to be confused with KQ. (laughs) And he said that he was still friends with Kim after they had agreed to see other people. He had spent the night with Kim the night before her disappearance. Then on the night she went missing, he was at his sister's house. He told the investigators how he and Josh had searched for Kim. They had checked all the chop shops in his old neighborhood. But he couldn't tell them where these chop shops were. He said that he and Josh had been out searching for Kim until 1 o'clock on the night she was killed. Jay said that Tommy was part of the mafia, which was false. 
Yeah, they're trying to point the detectives in any direction but their own. Well, of course. At the autopsy, it was determined that Kim had not been raped. She had been alive when she was set on fire because her body had also reacted by having blistering. And only a living person can transport blood to a burned area and create blisters. And Kim's trachea was completely black. So she had been breathing in that fire. Her stomach was empty except for a few milliliters of brown fluid, and one of her fingernails had zipper teeth beneath it. So this was from her clawing desperately, and they assumed it was from a zip-up jacket or a hoodie. You know, Josh took friends to the house where Kim had died to show them the location. He didn't look at a map or ask for directions, just drove directly to the house. And he did this several times with different people. That's kind of creepy. It's very creepy. He was enjoying this. Josh took April and a close friend of Kim's to the scene. Once there, he wanted to use this friend's camera to videotape the site. And the friend thought this was creepy. Because Josh was acting like a tour guide showing off the sites. Yeah. Very creepy. So when Jay began to panic and blame Josh for Kim's death, Josh started threatening him. If he talked, Josh said he would kill him. At night, Josh drove to the house by himself, too, and went inside. He went into the basement, and he was unhappy to see that the fire had not done more damage. It had burned into the first floor, but Kim's body and the house were still intact overall. He actually brought a beer with him and made a toast to the empty basement and said, Sorry, Kim. But, of course, this was not at all sincere. He was really fascinated by what he had done to her. So Josh, Jay, Nick, and Joey got together for another meeting. I wonder if they held that at Duncan's also. They sometimes w- it was at Duncan's, sometimes it was outside. Wherever. Yeah. They went over the events, and everybody's pointing fingers at everyone else. Joey and Jay seemed upset by Kim's death, but Josh and Nick showed no emotion. Josh didn't like how Joey was talking about the plan and how Josh had made a mess of things. But Josh told them that the fire was the only choice they had. He admitted that they had messed up because the fire had not destroyed everything. Then he warned the other three to keep their mouths shut. Yeah, but remember, Joey was making recordings of their meetings. He felt like he could nail Josh, but how would he do that without implicating himself? That was the problem. Very difficult. I don't see how he can. But Jay and Josh went to Kim's funeral because they were supposed to be friends of hers. And Jay cried at Kim's coffin and was actually comforted comforted by Kim's mother, which is just sad. And of course, Josh was just dry-eyed the whole time. Detective Tricola still didn't know at this time, though, what had happened with Kim's car, how it had been found. He did know that her cell phone had been used after she was last seen, and the cell phone company had no record of any conversation made on the phone that night. But it was possible that whoever tried to use the phone didn't have the security code. So whoever had tried to use the phone had done so in a 15-block area around the JFK Airport Hilton. The phone record showed a hit on an electronic repeater relay on Liberty Avenue, which is in Brooklyn, and they checked these areas but still didn't find her car. On the day of Kim's funeral, her car was still parked on the suburban street where her killers had left it. A neighbor familiar with Kim's case realized that this was likely her car. And he checked, and the plate number matched because they'd shown that on TV. When police came this time, they ran the plate, and it did come back as stolen. The car was guarded as the detective was notified and came to the location, along with a whole team of police officers and crime scene photographers. Only one family had noticed the car, but there was a witness who had seen a man in a small red car, circled the block several times that week. The neighborhood was canvassed, and a roll of duct tape was found inside the yard near the fence. Remember, they had thrown that, but unfortunately it had no fingerprints. And Kim's car had very obviously been wiped down. So the car was towed and thoroughly examined. If Kim had been carjacked, the car should have been already chopped up for parts. In the trunk, they found Kim's other seashell earring. Didn't have any fingerprints on it, but it did show that Kim had been put into her own trunk 
had been put into her own trunk by her abductors. The detectives were convinced that Kim had been tied up, put into her trunk, and driven to the vacant house where she had died. After the car was shown on the news, Joey took her car keys and threw them out a car window. The police became convinced at this point that Psycho had nothing to do with Kim's abduction or murder. The fact that Kim had not been sexually assaulted made it unlikely that Psycho had taken Kim. Because usually if a scorned lover does something like this, there's a sexual assault. Plus, Psycho had been very cooperative and didn't seem nervous. As two detectives named Tom and Louie went over the details of the crime together, they began looking at Josh Torres as the person responsible. Kim's dad had been cleared after Josh and Jay had tried to convince them that Tommy was connected to the mob, so they knew that wasn't true. But still, this was a tough case for investigators. All they really had was Kim's body, the burnt house, and the car. But the car had really no significant evidence, other than telling them that Kim had been transported in her trunk. The zipper teeth found under her fingernail were just kind of useless because like hairs or fibers, there's not really a scientific way to say who they belong to. The only way the zipper teeth might lead to something was if a jacket or a sweatshirt with four identical teeth missing was found and they knew that wasn't likely to happen. Now the son of the vacant house's owner was a guy named Wayne McCook. He was investigated but turned out to be a lawful person with no connection to Kim or her death. So the main focus of the investigation was on eliminating people close to Kim. So the investigators looked at family and old boyfriends. Jay, who had been a boyfriend, was acting nervous. Plus he had a criminal record. Also, Jay's friend Josh looked pretty good for the crime. Now both Jay and Josh had alibis for the Tuesday night that Kim was last seen, the investigators also talked to Sean Hayes, the Alphabet City drug dealer that had dated Kim for a short time. He also had an alibi, not an ironclad one, but he just didn't seem like the likely killer. He was very upfront about his criminal past and didn't seem to resent Kim for breaking up with him. After all, it had been him and their relationship who wanted to see other people. Right, so she hadn't broken up with him. Then on Friday, March 10th, detectives learned that 65 calls had been made from Kim's home phone on the day she disappeared. So this could have been Josh calling friends to look for Kim. But on Wednesday at 12.10 a.m., a cell phone or a beeper had been called. And the number was found to belong to Josh Torres's pager. But April and Josh had told the police that they were both at Kim's apartment in bed at that time. So looking at that Tuesday night, the same number had been called 10 minutes earlier and also at 10.41 p.m. So someone had paged Josh three times from Kim's house or apartment. This was the first lie that Josh got caught in. He had said that no calls went out from the apartment that night, but there were actually several. It turned out that none of Kim's friends from her phone book had been called until 5 p.m. Wednesday. But Josh had told Kim's dad that he had called everyone in the book at least an hour before that and that the only one who hadn't returned his call was Psycho. But Psycho had not been called actually until 9.30 that night. So there's another lie by Josh. April had told the police that Josh was home with her all night. So maybe he'd given his pager to someone else, they figured. Someone else who was in on the crime with him because they figured it was more than one person who did this. So if he had been in on the crime with someone and paged them from Kim's apartment, that would make some sense. Yes, it would. So Joey called the police station that was handling Kim's case and told the detective that the guy they were looking for was right under their noses. When they asked who that was, he said, Josh and Jay. Joey claimed he had overheard the two of them talking about it. It was a kidnapping gone wrong. But he wouldn't identify himself, and he hung up, so they couldn't trace the call. So Joey was kind of plagued by guilt over Kim's murder. But he didn't want to incriminate himself. He wasn't that upset about it. He did, though, feel like he wanted Josh and Jay to be arrested. Quite a conundrum, isn't it? I think he was getting a little bit afraid of Josh at this point as well. Detectives first told Tommy about their suspicions of Josh in a phone call after they heard from Joey anonymously. 
They asked Tommy, who had first mentioned Psycho to him as a suspect, and it was Josh. He'd been the first one to mention Psycho to Tommy. Tommy also told them that Josh and Jay told him they were looking at chop shops in Bushwick, but afterwards, they couldn't identify any of these shops that they supposedly had looked at. Tommy still didn't think that Josh could be involved because he'd seemed really helpful in the search. But he did agree with police that they did need to look into every possible suspect, so he agreed he wouldn't tell Josh that they were looking at him. So detectives invited Josh back for another interview, and they started out treating him like a friend of the victim who was eager to help in the investigation. In this interview, Josh talked like he was a protector of Kim, He claimed that he often talked to guys she had dated and told them to treat her right or deal with him. When they told Josh that they didn't think Psycho had killed Kim, he surprised them by agreeing with that, and he said, well, I have a theory, I have a theory that three guys did it. Yeah, according to Josh, these three men came up to Kim when she pulled into her garage, threw her to the ground, and put her in the trunk. They had to have two cars, so they got rid of Kim's car, and drove back to Queens, where they put her into the vacant house. Now, Joey actually got a little cocky at this point. Josh actually got a little cocky at this point, since he was clearly enjoying telling the detectives his theory. Just like the caller, that was Joey, Josh said that it had been a kidnapping gone wrong. But Josh said that the perpetrators were professionals who had never talked to the police or turn on one another. Which just kind of makes me chuckle, because he thought he was professional. Yeah, right. But when asked, Josh said that he had not given his pager to anyone. The phone records showed that the pager had been beeped from Kim's apartment, so when they confronted him with that, he didn't see that coming, and he just went kind of pale, and he said, Oh yeah, I had to go to the store. So at this point, the detectives were becoming considerably less friendly with Josh. They're kind of zooming in on him here now. He swore he had just left the house to get milk for his son, but then he was confronted with the fact that he had been paged three times that night. So he couldn't explain that, and he started to have a twitch in one of his eyes like a tick. He asked if they were trying to say that he killed Kim, and the detective told him they were talking to all of Kim's friends and acquaintances. But then Josh said, Hey, if I was involved, I would have fed her. So this was a stupid thing to say. Mr. Genius. He'd given himself away. He had, because only the detectives, the medical examiner, and the killer, or killers, knew that Kim had died with an empty stomach. Josh was told that he was a suspect. When he had claimed to be calling all of Kim's numbers from her address book from Kim's apartment, he had actually called five women, including Nick's girlfriends. Yeah, so nobody to really try and find Kim. No. So at this point, they know Josh is guilty. Probably, you know, the mastermind behind it. They asked him to come back for a polygraph, and he did agree. Then April was brought back for another interview, and she became really angry about Josh calling this woman he used to go out with. So they were kind of happy to get April to turn on him, hoping she might give them something. But she really didn't know much. She did kick him out of his apartment and didn't let him drive her car anymore. So he blamed the police for what was happening in his life. It wasn't going well. He's homeless without a car. He was living off of her. Yeah, he was. Tough move. Yeah, so next, Jay was called to come back to the station for an interview. And he described how he and Josh had searched their old neighborhood in several chop shops. But just like Josh... Jay could not give a location for more than one chop shop. He also said that Tommy had sent them to look for Kim and her car at the airport Hilton. Then he agreed to return for a follow-up interview. Now, before Josh came in for his polygraph test, he decided it would be a good idea to get high on some marijuana. He thought it might skew the results because he would be really relaxed. Didn't work that way, though. On the polygraph, Josh showed deception to all questions about his involvement in Kim's kidnapping and murder. But police let Josh leave, believing that everything was fine. They didn't want him to know that he had failed because they wanted to keep him cocky. They figured the more he bragged about what he had gotten away with, the more likely it was that someone would talk to the police. 
Yeah, so they met up again, all four of them, Josh, Jay, Joey, and Nick. They met near Nick's house this time. And Josh said some really crude things about Kim and told them that he had passed the polygraph. Josh felt like Joey was not solid, so Josh had been angry and more unstable than usual. He had recently bumped into a friend of April's mother while walking down the street, and he blamed the woman for bumping into him and actually punched this older woman, knocking her to the ground. Then he stole $400 in cash from her purse and her cell phone. He was identified right away as her attacker, but released on a desk appearance ticket, serving no time in jail for an assault and robbery, which is just stunning for me to imagine why he wasn't put in jail. That's violent. Yeah, plus he has a record. Yeah, and I think he was on probation or bail or something, right? He should have been thrown back in. He just wasn't a nice guy. So Joey wasn't exactly a nice guy either, but he did have some guilt over being involved in Kim's murder. Actually, you know, he was the one who hadn't given her food or water or a blanket, which might have helped her to survive. Yeah, he thought it'd be over in a day or so. So uh, it wouldn't be necessary to go to the house and risk being caught. Josh brought up killing Tommy Antonakis at this point, and that shocked Joey. Yeah, so Josh thinks he's a real criminal mastermind now. Josh told Joey that the police knew he was involved because he'd probably left fingerprints on the duct tape. And Joey told him that the police had followed him, hiding that he had made a phone call to police. Remember, he's the one that anonymously called the police. Right. When Josh gave Joey an evil look, Joey told him, I'm not going to burn alone for this. So Joey told the others that he would flip on them if he was arrested. He felt that the whole thing had been Josh's fault, and he was not going to go to prison for him. But, you know, Joey was really putting himself in a bad spot here. If he couldn't get the police to arrest Jay and Josh and get him off the street... He felt like he might have to kill them to save himself before they killed him. Kill or be killed, right? Yeah, no honor among thieves or murderers. He was trying really hard to come up with a way to set up Josh and Jay without revealing his own involvement, which was pretty much impossible. Before their meeting ended, Josh told the other three that they needed to keep their mouths shut and hang tough or else. Then he took out a matchbook and tossed a burning match at Joey and said, flame on. So that kind of became his thing. He was proud of that, yeah. So the four killers were no longer friends, and each was worried for himself. But they'd always be connected by this crime. They weren't going to get away that easy. Josh was becoming completely focused on threatening anyone who might rat him out. And he also was telling people about the murder like he was proud of it. He was telling a lot of people. He'd begun that tossing matches at people and joking about burning Kim. And I don't know why he thought nobody was going to tell on him, but he felt pretty confident. He did. Tommy Antonakis was a man on a mission. Each day he visited Kim's grave and talked to her. Then he started his full-time job of finding the men who had killed his daughter. Each day he went to the detectives and asked for an update on the case. He had also begun hanging out in front of the house where Kim had been murdered. He went door-to-door in the neighborhood with reward posters. He's, He's working it. Absolutely. At 1 a.m. on June 23rd, Joey parked his car in the garage space that he rented by the month. He was holding his watch in his left hand, and he picked up his young son and carried him over his shoulder. His apartment was two blocks away. They had only walked about half a block, though, when a man came up behind Joey and shot him in the back of his head, Whoa! killing him pretty instantly. His cervical spine was severed. And he fell to the ground, of course, still holding the young boy and the watch. His wife screamed and was able to pull her son out from under Joey. And fortunately, the little boy just had a bump on his head and no other injuries. But this was brutal and shocking. I guess. Joey had a lengthy record, so his killing looked like it might have just been a drug hit. But Josh was confessing proudly to everyone who would listen, except the police, to being Joey's killer. And Jay and Nick, you can bet, were acutely aware that they could be next. Oh, no question. Now, Joey had left recordings of his conversations with Josh, Jay, and Nick with his girlfriend. So when Nick heard about this, he went to Josh, and Josh began threatening her and her son. So this girlfriend actually moved away and went into hiding. 
Yeah, and Josh still isn't happy with his life at this point. He thinks he's getting away with the murder, but he's homeless and he doesn't have a car. So what he did next is he went to find a new woman to support him. It was in late July when he started talking to a young widow who went by Blondie. She'd been Jay's girlfriend a while back, and she had four young children. And Blondie was sympathetic to Josh's situation with the mother of his baby, April. Blondie had a nice apartment, a car, even some money in the bank, and a motorcycle. So Josh conned her into believing he was a good guy who would be there for her and her kids. Then he asked to move in with her. So he moved right into her apartment in the beginning of August. But after a while, Blondie was angry with Josh. He was still seeing April for one thing, and he was living off of Blondie. So she threatened to throw him out of her apartment. Then Josh confessed to the kidnapping and murder of Kim. He told Blondie about it, and he was proud of it. But he said that he had to kill someone else because he was trying to put all of the blame on him. So he embellished the story quite a bit, claiming to have tried to revive Kim in the basement. Then he showed her the souvenir he had taken of some duct tape. And he blamed Kim for her own death, saying that she was just spoiled with a rich father. Then he told her about killing Joey afterwards. And when she got upset about these murder confessions, what did he do but threaten to kill her next? So she was in a bad spot. After hearing what Josh was capable of and how he had no empathy or remorse, then she was afraid to kick him out of her apartment. So she was kind of a prisoner in her own home for a while and really afraid for her children as well. So when Blondie decided she couldn't deal with Josh anymore, she went to April's apartment and told her to come to her place and pick up Josh's things. April agreed, but she was laughing at Blondie for being afraid of Josh. April got Josh's things. Blondie hid the motorcycle because Josh liked to use it a lot and she was afraid he would come back and steal it. Now the very next morning, Josh kicked in her apartment door. He was yelling and swearing at Blondie and her children were more than upset, just beside themselves crying. Josh looked crazy, punched Blondie in the head. She was bleeding. Josh wanted the motorcycle and he threatened to burn down her apartment building. Yes, yeah, so as soon as he left the apartment, Blondie called someone to watch her kids and got in her car to drive to the police station. Josh reached into her car window, though, and grabbed her by the hair. He threatened to kill her if she said anything to the police. Then Nick showed up soon after and warned her that she better not go to the police. And he tried to get Blondie into his van. But she was street smart and she wasn't going to do that. She did have two brothers who came to her place and tried to protect her. And Josh told her that if he got arrested, she would be dead, so threatened to kill her. Blondie didn't know that Nick had once held a gun to a four-year-old's head, but she knew he was dangerous and his threats were real. As she tried to pull out and drive to the police, Josh and another guy blocked her in with another car. So she ran into the garage and grabbed a shovel to defend herself, but Josh took it away from her and beat her with it. He was hitting her in the face and on her head with a shovel. Knocked her onto the concrete. Jeez. And all this time, Bonnie's kids were watching and crying and screaming for him to stop. So it's just horrible. But Josh was looking like he really enjoyed beating her. Then finally, a neighbor yelled from her window that she was calling the police. And as Blondie was lying crying on the floor... Josh told her he'd be back to finish her off, and then he left. So Blondie got her bike and tried to flee on that, but Josh blocked her again. This time he pulled out a gun and yanked her off the motorcycle. Blondie was able to get to her car and drive away, but then he followed her on her motorcycle. And at this point, he's just in a crazy rage, and he was waving the gun at her as he's driving down the street. She drove up and down random streets until she was able to lose him, and then she was finally able to pull over and call 911 from a payphone. So Blondie and her kids were held under police guard at the station, and she told them everything she knew about Kim and Joey's murders. So she talked to the detectives handling Kim's case and was pretty helpful. She knew a lot. 
So then detectives learned that Joey's mother-in-law lived near the crime scene, so that made a connection between him and the house. At Joey's apartment, they found a set of handcuffs and the microcassette recorder, but the tape inside was blank, so we're not sure if he erased it or what. This was the incriminating tape. Yes. Got erased. I think that he had erased some of it, trying to not implicate himself. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Josh and Nick were arrested at separate times in September. Nick told the police that Josh was the mastermind who had told him the plan two days before he and Joey had kidnapped Kim. Josh said that the whole plan was Jay's idea. He claimed not to know where they were holding Kim, and he had never entered the house. Josh was blaming Jay, and Nick was blaming Josh. Yes, so the police looked for Jay, but he fled to Puerto Rico. Josh had named Jay in his modified confession, but Nick hadn't. So there was no evidence against Jay, but the police definitely still wanted to talk to him. They contacted Joey's father in Florida, who said he had heard about the tape, but he didn't have it. So he named some family members who might have possession of the tape, including Joey's uncle, Luis Negron. So Luis turned over the tape, and it was an undercover recording of the kidnappers made during the kidnapping. But the problem was that the tape had been tampered with. Joey had erased some bits, and there were large gaps in the recording. So it was also kind of difficult to understand at points, so it really wasn't going to be good evidence in court because it had been messed with too much. So they weren't even going to introduce it into evidence. But after Josh's arrest, the car he had been driving was impounded by police and searched for evidence from either of those two murders. Josh had told Blondie and some others that he had used April's car on the night he shot Joey. Blondie and her four children at this point were living in a small hotel room being protected by police. Blondie called the detectives and told them she was just stunned to see her name mentioned in a news story as the woman who had turned in the killers, so she felt like her life was in danger. She complained in her hurry to get somewhere safe with her family she hadn't bought any food or diapers either. So she was supposed to be in hiding. On the weekend after the arrests of Josh and Nick, she had called the Daily News, though, herself. She was angry that the paper ran an interview with Blondie, and the article included a picture of Kim, and then that horrible story of Josh kissing Kim on the forehead and telling her, I'm sorry it has to end this way, but life sucks, right before setting her on fire. Blondie had not gone before the grand jury yet, where Nick was expected to be indicted for second-degree murder, and Josh would be indicted for the murders of Kim and Joey. She denied talking to the media, though. When two officers went to take Blondie's children for pizza and help her get some necessities, Blondie's pager went off, and the officers were just incredulous to learn that she was communicating with people from her old life. <laughs> Not smart, Blondie. No. So they lectured Blondie about talking to the media and told her not to answer any more pages unless she wanted to get herself killed. So she did stop talking to the press, but she wasn't happy about living in that hotel room, and she asked to be moved to a real apartment. So they did locate her to an apartment in Brooklyn. Now Jay thanked Nick for not mentioning him in his statement that he'd given to the police, and he asked Nick to stay loyal to him. But Nick and Josh needed a favor from him in order to keep quiet. They wanted him, Jay, to kill Blondie, and Jay felt like he couldn't say no. If he refused, Nick would talk, and Jay would be in jail. He might even be added to their hit list. So Jay decided to play along even though he wouldn't kill anyone. He would try and stall them. Now, although Blondie had been warned by the detectives more than once to stop all contacts with her old associates, she ignored that advice. She was still answering pages on her old pager, calling them back from her unlisted phone number. One night in November, Blondie's phone rang, and it was her old boyfriend, Jay. He told her that he wanted to meet with her. He missed her. Jay assured her that he had not kidnapped or killed Kim. She knew that Jay had been involved with Josh, Nick, and Joey in Kim's murder, and she didn't trust him. Wise choice. Jay asked Blondie to give him her address and meet him somewhere. When she hung up, she was convinced that Jay was trying to set her up and have her killed. Well, he kind of was. He was. One night, Blondie got a call from a woman who knew Jay, and this call confirmed her fears. 
Jay was supposed to kill her for Josh and Nip. The woman said she was calling to warn her. She wanted Blondie to secretly listen in on a conference call with Jay, so Blondie agreed. The woman on the other end talked with Jay and asked him why he was going to kill Blondie. Jay told the woman that he wasn't sure if he could go through with it. He said that Josh and Nick wanted him to kill Blondie, but he didn't want to do it. So listening to this phone call, of course, was upsetting for Blondie. She was afraid that she was losing her mind at this point. The following week, she called the detectives. She said that her brother had threatened to reveal her new address to the guys who were looking for her. So the detectives arranged to meet with her at her apartment, and she told them that Jay was back in town. The detectives didn't like that Jay was trying to find her, but she didn't know where Jay was, and Jay didn't know where Blondie was. So one week later, Blondie got on a plane to Ecuador. Two weeks later, Blondie returned to the U.S. at Miami International Airport. After clearing customs, she was scheduled to fly to New York. Florida was a major point of entry for illegal drugs into the U.S., and customs carefully searched luggage and people when they arrived. So it turned out that Blondie was a drug mule. There were condoms filled with drugs in her suitcase, and she admitted that she had also hidden drugs inside of her vagina. So Blondie was taken to the hospital where a doctor removed the drugs, and they found over a kilogram in total of concentrated heroin paste. And this was worth about a million dollars. So Blondie didn't make her flight to New York. <laughs> no, I'm sure. And she was the state's star witness in Kim's murder case, but now she's arrested for narcotics trafficking, so that's not going to work. But Blondie had a story. <laughs> yeah, she told the DEA that gangsters were holding her kids hostage, and they were threatening to kill them unless she became a drug mule. So this was a plan to discredit her as a witness, she told the DEA. So this must have been some scene. An NYPD emergency services team was sent to Blondie's home in Brooklyn to rescue her four kids. They wore bulletproof flak vests and carried machine guns. They stormed the apartment, but all they found was a terrified babysitter. There were no hostages, no kidnappers. Blondie was lying about her children being held hostage at gunpoint. Yes, yeah, so she was done as far as a witness. <laughs> Yes. So Jay took her place as the star witness. He felt betrayed by Josh and the others, who he said were evil. He said that his biggest mistake was following a stupid street code. The record shows that Josh, Nick, and Jay followed this code, but only until they were arrested. Then each of them ratted out the others in order to get a deal for themselves, which is usually how it works. Right. Jay claimed on the witness stand at Josh's murder trial that he didn't think Kim was going to be kidnapped, even though Josh talked about the plan in advance. He also said that no one had planned on killing Kim, which is probably true. When he told how Josh had kissed Kim's forehead and talked to her before setting her on fire, the jurors and others in the courtroom were just shocked and disgusted. But Jay was out of jail after a two-year prison term because of the deal he made with prosecutors. Well, so he was extremely lucky. I hope he turned his life around. Certainly was. Because he was guilty. Mm -hmm. This is just remarkable because he admitted that he had known his friends kidnapped Kim and did nothing about it. He didn't even do anything after she was murdered. Josh was found guilty of Kim's kidnapping and murder. His trial lasted two weeks. But he was found not guilty in the killing of Joey Negron. When the guilty verdicts were read, Tommy Antonakis raised his fist in the air. The DA called Kim's murder among the most savage and brutal crimes ever to have been committed in Queens. You know, and that has to be saying something, right? Because yeah. I'm sure there are a lot of crimes. I would think. Prosecutors call Josh Torres a murderer and a moron. I agree. I mean, it's such a betrayal. You know, above and beyond everything else, all this horribleness, it is a betrayal at the heart of it. Kim had allowed Josh and his girlfriend and child to stay in her apartment for free. And he used that time there to plan her kidnapping to make money off of her. Then when she was missing, he pretended to be a concerned friend and pretended to search for her. So Josh Torres was sentenced to 58 years to life in prison. And Nick Labretti went to trial soon after and was convicted of murder, kidnapping, and arson in Kim's death. And he was sentenced to 58 years to life as well. So two got life, one got two years, and one got murdered. 
So crime doesn't pay. They didn't get any money either. It's a remarkable case. Very interesting. Isn't it? So our sources, there are a lot of things out there. We went through the New York Times archives from 1995 to 1997. We read a book titled Burned Alive, A Shocking True Story of Betrayal, Kidnapping, and Murder. That's written by Kieran Crowley. We also looked through the UPI archives and articles on December 10th of 1996, the Equal Justice Initiative from September 19th, 2016, and also information on the Equal Justice Initiative website this year, 2021. There is an episode of Investigation Discovery's show, The Perfect Murder, and the episode is titled Ring of Fire, and this was released in 2015. It's Season 2, Episode 3. TCB's music is written and produced by Tristan Capel. Just a quick reminder, we do have a lot of merch on sale on our website, tiegrabber.com. So if you're in need of any merch, give it a look. If you'd like to get your future TCB episodes commercial-free, get extra members-only episodes, and get a free gift of a beer glass, a bottle opener, or coasters, along with stickers and magnets and buttons, you might want to consider subscribing as a tie grabber at tiegrabber.com. Also, if you enjoy the show, we would really appreciate your leaving a review for us on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen. We love the reviews, and it helps us to find new people who might like the show as well. So let's do feedback. It looks like we have some voicemails. We do. We've had a couple good weeks of voicemails. All right, let's start with Alyssa. She had a comment on, actually, it was a premium episode we did on the Lululemon murder. But that's a pretty well-known case, so let's play that. Greetings. I am calling about your recent tie grabber episode. Um, my name is Alyssa and I'm actually calling. Um, I think that checking the bag of retail employees is pretty commonplace. When I was in my early 20s, I worked for Express World Brand, and that was a practice every single day, male or female, any employees, they checked your bag as you left. Um, I think that's because People tend to shoplift, unfortunately, um, but that's, I, I believe it's a pretty common practice across the field of retail. Okay, that's all. Okay. Have an awesome day. Bye. Thank you, Alyssa. I believe you. I bet it is common. Do we do that in other professions, or are we picking on retail staff? Well, I think you're going to take pains to uh, prevent certain things from happening. I know, but so. I don't think I could do it. I don't think if I worked with someone, I would search their bag. I would feel terrible about that. Well, then you wouldn't be working at that establishment. Eh, it's just me. I understand why they do it, and I'm sure they do. So thanks, Alyssa. I'm sure you're right. Okay, so the next voicemail is from Genesis. We got one from Genesis. All right. And she's commenting on our episode regarding Barry Crane, the bridge player. Hi guys, my name is Genesis and I live in Texas. I am so proud of you guys for the Barry Crane episode and speaking so much truth about the HIV AIDS epidemic. I myself work for the HIV Administrative Agency, one of seven in the state of Texas, and we are responsible for prioritizing and allocating Ryan White's HIV AIDS program funds to our providers in our regions. And I really am just impressed with the magnitude of which you all spoke about the stigmatization and really just the the unfair treatment of those living with HIV and AIDS. And really there is hope because viral suppression can happen if you are diagnosed, you start treatment quickly and start your antiretroviral treatments. You are able to live essentially a life that would be no different than somebody without HIV. Viral suppression occurs when there is essentially little to no HIV virus in the blood, about 200 copies per milliliter to be exact, which means that you cannot transmit the HIV virus to a partner through IV injectable drugs, whatever means it may be. It is essentially non-transmittable. So what that means is that you can live that healthy life. And at this point in time, currently it is at 88% nationwide viral suppression. So it's looking up. And I thank you guys for doing your part to help end the epidemic of HIV and AIDS. And it just really spoke to my heart. And thank you guys so very much on 
my behalf and also of the clients that I serve that are living heroically with HIV or AIDS every day. Bye, guys. Thanks for all you do. Well, thank you, Genesis. That's really impressive what you do. Yeah, these these new medications are very effective. That's great news. I have to admit, I didn't know about not being able to transmit it when you have the low viral load. I didn't know that. You probably knew that. I knew that. And actually, just as we were getting ready to record this episode, I was turning off the TV and they were running an ad for one of these new antivirals. I forget the name of it. Or maybe I just don't want to publicize it. Very impressive. That is. I mean, there's some good news, right? That that's been accomplished. Yeah, because you know, trying to find a vaccine just hasn't worked. There, there is no vaccine available for AIDS, so you need to do something. Well, yeah, it sounds like remarkable progress. After we did that episode, we did actually sit down and watch the movie Philadelphia, which was from the 80s or 90s, early 90s, I think. I think early 90s. And one thing that was remarkable to me is when they showed the civil case So Tom Hanks was a gay man in the movie with AIDS, and he was fired. So he had a civil suit against this law firm that he worked for. But anyway, the remarkable thing to me was how people would say that people who got AIDS through a blood transfusion got sick, not because of anything they did wrong, which of course is saying that if you're having sex as a gay man, you did something wrong and you deserve it. It's while you're a sinner. Which is really upsetting, yeah. So that's just remarkable. And to see the progress, of course, is really nice. Yes, it is. Yes. And we would be remiss if we didn't say this case was brought to us by someone else. All we did was give our opinions and talk about it. Yes. I will just say one more thank you to Jean for that excellent case that she referred. Absolutely. I'm going to do one more voicemail, and then we're going to get going because it's getting late. So this is Stephanie. Yeah, Stephanie has some case suggestions, and a beer recommendation. That's always welcome. Let's hear it. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Stephanie from California. I wanted to suggest a few cases. The first is Eric Smith. He murdered a four-year-old when he was 13 years old, and he remains incarcerated. Um, now, Jill's mentioned her interest in juveniles being extensively incarcerated for crimes committed at a young age, so I thought this would make a good case. The second option is more well-known, but I have a book recommendation for it. It's Charles Manson, and the book is Manson in His Own Words. It's a great book. I really enjoyed reading the other side of that story. Um, Even if you decide to not do that case, I still highly recommend the book. There's a lot of detail that I think you'd appreciate. Um, My last suggestion is Ed Kemper. I'm not too familiar with him, but I know he was a serial killer and his surrender was very interesting and very unusual because he he didn't have to give himself up, but you know, it's great that he did. I also wanted to suggest a beer. Um, My favorite beer is Moostrol. I would provide a review of it, but I'm, I, I just know it's not gonna stand up to Dick's reviews, so I'm just not even going to bother. Maybe he can review it himself. It's a really chill beer. It's only like 5%. It's it's really good. I like it. It's just, if you want to check it out, and thank you. Um, oh, and I just wanted to let you know, I know you don't really like praise, but I really enjoy your podcast, and especially during this weird-ass year, so please, please keep it up, and thank you. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. Actually, having the podcast to do has made it a lot easier for us to get through this weird year. Yeah, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. So let's do the beer recommendation first. Do you have anything to say about that? No, it's a, it's a nice beer. As Stephanie said, it's not one of these alcohol bombs. So you've had it? Yeah. What we need is a Montana case because it's Big Sky Brewing Company. We've never done Montana so, in how many years? Four or five years we've been doing we're this? We're approaching five. Yeah. So I think I'll... Once we have a Montana case, I will do moose drool. Or or maybe I can convince Stephanie to write the review. I think so. We'll see. I'll remember. I got her email. Yeah. I think she should be more generous with herself. I'm sure she'd do a fine job. Oh, of course. When we've had those contests, we've gotten some great beer reviews. Uh, We have. Yeah. So the one case that you were thinking that we might cover soon was the Eric Smith. Yeah, that was an interesting one. As Stephanie said, 
Eric was 13 years old when he murdered four-year-old Derek Roby, and that was in 1993. Smith apparently had been sent home from summer camp because of inappropriate behavior, and he just happened to meet Roby, who was on his way to camp, unaccompanied by an adult or anyone. He killed a little kid. He was convicted of second-degree murder in 1994 and sentenced to the maximum sentence available at the time, which was nine years to life in prison. Since his sentencing, he's been denied parole ten times, most recently last February 2020. And you had looked at some stuff about these youthful offenders, right, Jill? Yeah, well, I'm kind of familiar with this case. At least I recognize Eric Smith. He's been on TV. It's a fairly well-known case. And he looks like Opie from Andy Griffith, little red-haired boy. So yeah, I did look at the laws a little bit because it just seems unimaginable to put a 13-year-old in prison for life. It's just really hard to imagine that, although I see that the crime was horrible. So I was looking it up, and in 2018, California Governor Jerry Brown signed into law new legislation and that prohibits the prosecution of 14 and 15 year olds as adults. Before that, prosecutors could request to transfer 14 and 15 year olds to adult court if they were charged with a serious crime. So children under 16 who are convicted under this new law are now held in locked juvenile facilities instead of adult prisons, which has to be somewhat better. There are 12 states still that do not have a minimum age for prosecuting a child as an adult. And there have just been crazy cases leaving 8, 9, and 10-year-old kids vulnerable to being in adult jails and prisons, which you can imagine, there's a lot of abuse and trauma involved in that. Yeah, you're not going to see much rehabilitation. No. When you think about human growth and development, children under 14 are very immature and impulsive. They haven't developed the judgment or the ability to assess consequences of their actions. So it's more so than older teens, I think. They're very vulnerable to peer pressure. But according to the Equal Justice Initiative, children under the age of 14 are protected in almost every area of the law due to their unique developmental qualities. But children as young as eight have been prosecuted as adults in some states. And others have set the minimum age at 10, 12, or 13. So although children lack the judgment, maturity, and knowledge that adult defendants are expected to have, Courts often fail to take that into account, that the children are different. So it's really something that I think needs a lot more research. We need to do a lot more with that. A lot more, of course, with rehabilitation. Someone that young should have a chance to rehabilitate. So it's just really hard, the whole thing. Of course, a child being killed is horrible, and then a child being sent to prison for life is horrible, almost as horrible. Yeah, well, there's no easy answer to that, is there? No, it's not an easy topic at all. So I think we better wrap it up. This has been a long episode. Yes, it has. I started talking too much. No, I love it when you talk. You're a good talker. (laughs) So let's go finish up our beers, toddle off back home. (laughs) Down the hall? Down the hall. Okay. All right. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening and for sharing your feedback with us. We'll see you next time at The Quiet End. We'll save a seat for you. Bye-bye. Bye. They had been raised in the Catholic Church, but had begun practicing Santeria. I don't practice Santeria. I love that song. They, they had <laughs> secret ceremonies, he says, ignoring his wife. <laughs>